it may be hard for us to think about global warming here as we're all freezing our bits off in the middle of Melbourne winter. But the Australian Academy of Science reminded us with its key publication yesterday of a document which represents very much a consensus, uh, their consensus on the science of climate change. And if climate models predict, as they do, a two to seven degrees Celsius rise in global temperatures by the year 2000 and 2100, uh, then the Academy in that report reminds us that a two degree global warning, warming, so that's at the lower end of that range, would lead to a significantly different world from the one we now inhabit. They remind us that that points to more heat waves, fewer cold spells, changes to rainfall patterns and higher global average rainfall, higher plant productivity in some places, but decreases in others disturbances to marine and terrestrial ecosystems and biodiversity, disruption to food production, food, the stuff that keeps us going in some regions, uh, keeps us going everywhere, but certainly disruption to food production in some regions, rising sea levels and decreases in Arctic ice cover. All this sounds sort of bigger than Ben-Hur, but what we want to do today is bring it back to us and our bodies and the organisms that occupy us. What does climate change mean for the bugs, the viruses, the parasites that from time to time like to call our body home and make us very sick indeed? And in Australia, I guess it's easy for us to forget um, how significant this is. I'm told that 194 million people in China are infected with hookworm. It's reported that every 30 seconds a child dies of malaria somewhere in the world. So. Big themes for us tonight, and without further ado, I'd love to introduce one of Australia's most brilliant communicators of science and liveliest communicators. Sir Gus Nossel was recognised as Australian of the Year in 2000. He was the director of the Walter and Eliza Hall Institute of Medical Research for 31 years, up until 1996. He's Professor Emeritus in the Department of Pathology at the University of Melbourne, a consultant uh, to the World Health Organisation and the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation and countless other roles, including what I think will be valuable for us tonight, um, Deputy Chairman of the Council for Aboriginal Reconciliation uh, between 98 and 2000. Thank you, Gus. Natasha, Jeff, Helen, Graham, my dear fellow panellists, ladies and gentlemen. It's good to see uh, so many of you here and to be able to welcome you uh, on the part of the scientific community, the global scientific community, for this interesting and controversial conversation. Let me start with an amusing anecdote. 35 years ago, Malcolm Fraser heard somewhere that a new ice age might be coming. He asked the Australian Academy of Science to look into it. At that time, I was on the council of the academy, and for reasons that needn't detain us, I was about to go on a short overseas trip that included the National Centre for Atmospheric Research in Boulder, Colorado, USA. So I volunteered to ask some questions there. Guess what? They said, no ice age. But we're just starting to consider whether the build-up of CO2 in the atmosphere could exert a greenhouse effect and cause global warming. Yes, that was the very beginning of it. You all know how the story has developed over the last 15 years. I too wanted to make reference to the hot off the press report from the Australian Academy of Science uh, on the science of climate change. And uh, two to seven degrees rise uh, by the year 2100 from pre-industrial temperatures. And you've heard the uh, possibility of more heat waves, fewer cold spells, changed rainfall patterns, uh, with the uh, more frequent flood events and rising sea levels and more high tide events. Obviously, a seven degree rise would result in all these impacts being very much larger than of two degrees. Now, there are at present 
1,415 organisms causing infectious diseases in humans. Can you believe that? 1,415 pathogens threatening us. Many of these like it warm and moist. Some of these disease agents are carried by what we call vectors. For example, mosquitoes, ticks, sand flies, or even snails. The vectors too are affected by climate change. Malarial mosquitoes can only breed at temperatures over 16 degrees centigrade. In Africa, a small increase in winter temperature would extend the malarial zones upwards, possibly to include large urban areas such as Nairobi, Kenya, or Harare, Zimbabwe, which are currently malaria-free. Malarial mosquitoes would benefit from more breeding pools, freshwater pools after high rainfall events would help Anopheles mosquitoes, the carriers of malaria. Increased high tides would help Aedes mosquitoes, which breed in more saline water, and of course they're the carriers of dengue. Also, pathogens mature more quickly in mosquitoes at higher temperatures. Consider the awful worm disease, cystosomiasis, or snail fever. This is carried by freshwater snails. Regional warming could further the spread of these snails, and warmer temperatures encourage more cystosome production by one given snail. Spread could also be helped by dams, lakes, and irrigation systems. And this leads to an important general point, perhaps the most important single point I need to make tonight. Climate change should not be looked at in isolation. Other social and ecological changes impact on infectious diseases. Forest clearance, intensified agriculture and livestock production, uh, livestock production methods, and urbanisation. All of these have profound effects. Crowding, the mixing of people, domestic animals and wildlife along with a warm, humid environment. What ideal conditions for pathogen evolution? Now, crowded live animal markets encourage transmission from birds and animals to humans, as in the case of bird flu and of SARS. Clearing of riparian vegetation for intensive grazing can lead to contamination of waterways. Increasing population and greater connectedness via trade, travel and migration favour spread of infectious diseases. Nutrition, as Natasha said, is enormously important. Climate change can affect regional food yields and thus the nutritional status of populations. Undernutrition can impair the immune status and lead to susceptibility to infections. And then you can get quite unexpected relationships. The virus disease of cattle, known as rinderpest, was inadvertently introduced to Africa from India in imported cattle. The virus absolutely decimated herds of domesticated cattle and oxen, reducing agricultural productivity. But it also infected wildebeest, therefore reducing the chances of nutrition through bushmeat by hunting. What was the result? Two-thirds of the Maasai people of East Africa were wiped out. Two-thirds. The loss of the native herbivores altered the grassland ecology, and that encouraged thickets to grow. And the tsetse fly loves these thickets. They carry African sleeping sickness. So the mortality from a truly dreaded disease was increased. How's that for the connectedness of apparently disparate things? What we need is a new eco-social model of disease emergence and spread. Now, what does all of this mean for Melbourne? Well, I'm sure you've guessed my position on this. The effects of climate change on infectious disease in Melbourne may eventually emerge, there's no evidence that they have so far. 
but the effects on the poor countries will be vastly greater. If you're on the brink already, more malaria or dengue fever because of climate change is hardly what you need. But don't for a moment assume that Australia is immune from unexpected new infections. There's the well-known Hendra virus, which moved from fruit bats to horses to fortunately only a few humans. But let me tell you about a story that's had less publicity. We have a thriving mariculture industry in Australia, much of it centred on bluefin tuna. To feed these, we imported some frozen pilchards from Thailand. But these carried a newly discovered herpes virus. This spread around the Australian coast with devastating mortality among our own wild pilchards. So no Aussie feed for the Aussie tunas and a multi-million dollar loss to our fishing industry. Ladies and gentlemen, the world's been lucky in the last few years. The potential for true global devastation from SARS, bird flu, or H1N1 swine flu has not occurred. And horrible diseases like mad cow disease and the Ebola virus have been well contained. Even the HIV AIDS pandemic may have passed its peak, horrendous though the toll it still exerts. But many social and ecological changes can impact pathogens, vectors and hosts. We must be vigilant. We must increase interdisciplinary research and, yes, ladies and gentlemen, take climate change very seriously. Thank you. Thank you, Sir Gus. Important words that will get us started. Um, we're in also good hands with our next guest. Professor Anne Kelso is director of what's called the World Health Organization Collaborating Centre for Reference and Research on Influenza in Melbourne, uh, which means, I don't know whether you knew this, uh, that means that that centre is one of four in the world uh, that monitors human influenza viruses. Um, and identifies the latest strains as they come through for the production of influenza vaccines, which Anne, uh, through her research colleagues at the University of Melbourne, is also involved in. She serves on committees that advise the Australian government on flu pandemics, and she's part of a research team at Melbourne Uni as well. And so when there's a really nasty strain of bird flu, we all want to be your best friend, Anne. Thank you. Give her a warm welcome. Well, thank you, Natasha, and good evening, everyone. The flu season's just starting in Melbourne, and it's a little bit late this year, but lots of people have had colds, but actually not many people have had real flu yet, that is, flu that's caused by actual influenza viruses. Now, we quite rightly associate flu with winter, and uh, in fact, it's true that seasonal flu is highly seasonal, winter-associated in temperate climates, as we have in Melbourne. Infections do occur throughout the year, probably introduced by travellers, but they don't take off until we get a spike of infections uh, when the weather gets cold, and usually then there's a peak around July or August. So we don't fully understand why flu is seasonal in humans, but it's probably because the environmental conditions suit the virus, help it to survive and transmit between people. There may also be some effects uh, on the host, on us, um, because we crowd together in trams and trains and places like this and uh, have lower melatonin levels, lower vitamin D levels. So there may be both a virus and a host effect. Now, the seasonality of human flu is so predictable that flu vaccination is also a seasonal process. In Australia, the vaccine is produced from round about October through until February, March, and then we have a campaign to encourage people to be vaccinated in time to develop antibodies so that they're protected when the flu viruses start to circulate. Uh, so we might think that with global warming, with warmer temperatures in Melbourne, we might start to see less flu, and of course that is possible. 
But in fact, flu also circulates in the tropics and uh, uh, circulates throughout the year, and it's probably the tropics that then seeds viruses to us for our winter. And some places like Singapore and Hong Kong and even Darwin have two flu seasons uh, some years. So with climate change, maybe our flu season will decline, but it's equally possible, I think, that we might start to have a more unpredictable flu season and therefore more difficulty controlling flu through a timed um, vaccination program of vulnerable people. Now, given that we've got good vaccines for flu, why can't we get rid of it altogether, as we've done, in fact, for, for smallpox? This is where I think flu gets really interesting and has a lot to teach us about other infectious diseases as well. Now, the first reason that we can't get rid of flu is because the virus is highly changeable. The uh, genetic material of the flu virus can undergo spot changes very quickly in order to avoid the antibodies that our bodies raise against the vaccine or against uh, infection itself. And this is why we need to keep updating uh, flu vaccines. The second reason we can't eliminate flu completely from humans is because, in fact, humans aren't the primary host of most flu viruses. Birds are, particularly water birds like ducks and geese. And that means that globally we have an enormous reservoir of influenza viruses of many different types in uh, ducks, geese and, and other water birds. So we can't hope to get rid of that pool of viruses by vaccination. And this, in fact, brings us to pandemics, because this is really how pandemics arise. Pandemics start when two different flu viruses infect the same animal at the same time. And then you can get a, a re-combination, uh, if you like, a reshuffling of the genetic material of those two viruses to make a new variant flu. And, and that will cause a pandemic if it has two particular crucial characteristics. The first is that the virus has now changed in a way that our immune system can no longer see it. And that means that the uh, entirety of the global human population is vulnerable to this new virus. The second feature that that new virus must have is the ability to infect humans and then to spread very easily between us. Now, this has happened four times in the last century. Spanish flu in 1918-19, Asian flu in 1957, Hong Kong flu in 1968, and then, of course, uh, swine flu uh, in 2009. Now, sometimes, not always, that new virus will cause extremely severe disease in very many people, and that's what happened with Spanish flu in 1918-19. That virus killed, it's estimated, of course, it can only be an estimate, perhaps 50 million people over a year or 18 months as it spread around the world. That was 2.5% of the entire population of the world at that time, which was about 1.8 billion people. Fortunately, the three more recent pandemics have, uh, they have caused severe disease, but in a very much smaller number of people. Now, the lessons we can learn from flu pandemics don't only apply to flu. I think that they can teach us much that's relevant to other infections, including the emerging and uh, rearranging re, uh, um, infections that uh, Gus has just been talking about. And these include infections that will be affected by climate change. For example, the risk of emergence and spread of new pandemic flu viruses is greatly increased, as Gus has mentioned, with the clustering of domestic animals and humans, and particularly for flu, birds, swine, and people, as we see in many uh, developing world communities. Another is by farming practices, particularly where you then bring large numbers of animals together without good infection control. And then thirdly, there's uh, the consequence of high density human habitation, uh, particularly again in poor, impoverished conditions. Again, we've heard from Gus how climate change and, in fact, extreme weather events as well that flow from climate change have a pre preferential impact on the least developed communities of the world and can result in the displacement of many millions of people. And these are the conditions that will expose people to those uh, particular risks of the emergence and spread of new diseases. Now, in 2009, as in earlier flu pandemics, certain groups of people were much more likely to suffer uh, severe illness. Australian indigenous people were 10 times more likely to be hospitalised than other Australians during the pandemic last year. 
people who were immunosuppressed due to HIV infection also had a significantly increased risk of dying from uh, swine flu. In 1918 also it was realised that poverty was an important predictor of mortality from that uh, flu pandemic virus. So with climate change we can expect that displaced people, people with uh, inadequate nutrition, people who carry other infections like HIV will be affected much more severely by pandemic flu and other new infectious agents than most of the rest of us, particularly here in a city like Melbourne. Pandemics also remind us that we live in an interconnected world. Infectious diseases don't pay attention to borders. And it's also now a very fast world. Today, a passenger uh, can carry a new flu virus from Singapore or Mexico City or even London to Melbourne before they even display symptoms that we can pick up as they emerge from the plane. In 1918, Spanish flu took many months, perhaps as much as a year, to uh, reach Australia. And in Australia, we kept it out by keeping the arriving ships parked offshore until all the infected people had either died or recovered from pandemic flu. I can't imagine having done that uh, with the jumbo jets last year. So in 2009, swine flu arrived in Auckland on a Boeing 747 on Anzac Day, the 25th of April, which was the same day that WHO announced to the world that they were concerned that a new pandemic might be starting. A group of high school kids from Auckland were returning home from a school trip to Mexico. Some of them were a bit fluey on the plane. A few other people who were lucky enough to sit near them picked up the virus. And uh, when they arrived in Auckland, a very alert GP swabbed the sick kids. And the local lab then, uh, realising that this was a, a flu virus, but not necessarily uh, one that they knew, sent them straight on to our centre in Melbourne and we were able to confirm uh, that they were in fact swine flu. Now this rapid response was possible because the health community around the world had been alerted to this new virus by email. So we knew instantly, as soon as the US Centers for Disease Control did, that uh, there was a new virus uh, in North America. And in Melbourne, we were able to identify this new virus overnight because the US scientists had done the genetic sequence of the swine flu virus and they put it online in a public database so that once we sequenced the Auckland, Auckland samples, we could show straight away that they were actually the same thing. Now, New Zealand prevented the spread of those high school, the spread of viruses from those high school cases, but eventually the virus did take off there and uh, by October had infected about 18% of New Zealanders and one in three kids and probably the figures were much the same eventually in Australia. In Melbourne you'll probably remember that in May the health authorities were very focused on the airport and uh, there was mostly testing of people uh, who had respiratory inf infection and had either just travelled from North America or had contact with a recent traveller. But by the time we had our first bona fide uh, laboratory diagnosed case in Melbourne, it turned out very quickly that in fact the virus had already been here and it had snuck in uh, under our noses, so to speak, and uh, spread amongst uh, school children, probably along the major um, public transport routes. And you might remember that Clifton Hill Primary School was closed and then a few others, Thornbury High, and uh, classes closed in a number of schools to the north and west of the city as the virus spread amongst schools school kids and even those who were quarantined of course tended to meet their friends at McDonald's. So the, the lesson there from flu that I think applies to many other diseases is that it's essentially impossible to keep out infectious agents that spread easily between people and don't make everybody visibly sick so they can arrive without us realising. Now, talking about pandemics makes everything sound a bit hopeless, uh, but again, I think influenza offers us some um, encouraging ideas that were put to the test last year and that are also very important now and in the future for other infectious disease challenges. Now, one of those is the importance of planning and preparation, and thanks to the SARS and uh, bird flu outbreaks, which I haven't discussed, but Gus has mentioned, many governments, international agencies and businesses now have pandemic plans that mean that they can make a more rapid and coordinated response to a health emergency. And we, we will need those plans and their, their evolutions of them um, increasingly over time. 
global monitoring of infectious diseases. Now, the WHO network, of which our laboratory is one part, that monitors and shares information about flu viruses and then assists with vaccine production, is really a very powerful model of international cooperation in the control of one important disease. The benefits of communication technology and medical science. Today, we can share new information effectively instantly. We can have a greater understanding than ever before of the basis of disease. We have the ability to identify new viruses, bacteria, parasites extremely quickly. We have drugs. We have an increasing range of vaccines for prevention. And in Australia, we're lucky enough to have excellent clinical care if we get to that point. Also today, and this is really my uh, final point, perhaps more than ever before, I think we have a global awareness and a sense of global responsibility. In Australia, I think we look outwards and we recognise our mutual dependence on other people and other countries, economically, culturally, socially, and of course, in responding to climate change and infectious disease threats. So I think that we, we face many challenges and there'll probably be growing challenges in the future. And perhaps they'll be insurmountable. But we do have some powerful tools if we choose to use them and to share them. Thank you.